Welcome to the second annual UBC Tianju lecture in honor of Dr. Leon Hurwitz. I am Sherilyn Orbaugh and I'm head of the Department of Asian Studies at UBC, which is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I've been asked to say a few words about Dr. Hurwitz and about the Asian Studies Department. When Dr. Hurwitz joined our department in 1971, he was already well known in his field as a polyglot scholar and a brilliant translator. In fact, I remember the first time I heard Dr. Hurwitz's name. It was in an undergraduate class that I was taking in the United States, a class on Buddhism. And uh, in this class, we read the Lotus Sutra in Dr. Hurwitz's translation, The Lotus of the True Dharma, which had just come out a year or two before. I don't actually remember much at all about most of my undergraduate classes, but I clearly recall the professor in this class saying that this new translation was astounding and a revelation. I remembered those words when I came to UBC in 1997 and joined the Department of Asian Studies and learned that Dr. Hurwitz had been one of the department's founding fathers and had taught here for about 20 years. Dr. Hurwitz was a towering figure in Buddhist studies and his lifetime of work continues to be influential today, not just in Buddhology, but also in fields such as Chinese medieval history and Indian philosophy, among several others. We're very grateful to Dr. Hurwitz's wife and children for their continuing interest in our department and the way they've generously shared several items from Dr. Hurwitz's work life, which can be viewed on the website. Leon Hurwitz really laid the, the cornerstone for Buddhist studies at UBC, which is still thriving today, just amazingly um, active and um, productive today, thanks in part to the amazing work of my colleague, Jin, uh, Jinhua Chun, and also to the generous support of the Tianzhu Buddhist Network. This support has allowed us to increase the number of Buddhist studies courses that we teach in our department. We put on international conferences, there's been support for graduate students, among many other ways that Tianzhu has um, enhanced Buddhist studies at UBC. We're profoundly grateful, particularly for the ways that Tianzhu has helped us to connect with scholars from all over the world. One great example of that being today's lecture. Uh, I understand that there are uh, attendees here from all over North America and from Asia. In conclusion, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the second annual lecture in honor of um, Dr. Leon Hurwitz. Today's speaker is the distinguished professor John Kishnick from uh, Stanford University, who will be introduced by Jinhua Chan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sani. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Oppa, uh, for uh, getting out so early <laughs> and, uh, to give us such a uh, wonderful introduction to our lecture series. Um, I, I'm Jinghua Chen, so I teach East Asian Buddhism at UBC. Uh, it's my honor uh, to be here um, as sort of uh, a successor to Professor Neon Hurwitz. <laughs> uh, but of course, the, I, uh, I think this is a very, very far, far, far away, uh, like far, far, far behind Professor Neon Hurwitz in terms of his um, let's go, uh, research goal, research skill, work research talent. Um, but we are very happy uh, since uh, last year, we uh, were able to set up such as a series, a lecture series in honor of him. And uh, we are also very uh, happy uh, to see quite a lot of uh, uh, scholars are willing to, uh, to join us in painting homage to this unusual uh, scholar. Uh, the first speakers for uh, this lecture is uh, uh, Professor Baswell uh, from UCLA. And uh, today's, uh, it can be great pleasures uh, to have uh, my esteemed colleague, also uh, a very good friend, uh, Professor John Kislik, uh, to a give another momentum <laughs> to these uh, lectures. Uh, Professor John Kismet 
uh, I believe that uh, all of you are very familiar uh, with him. If not uh, in person, you would definitely know where, very well about his research. Um, Professor John Kislik uh, uh, mainly work on uh, Buddhist biography, uh, uh, Buddhism's influence on material cultures, um, and as represented by uh, two of his uh, extremely important and also well, very well read books. And first book is actually, I myself have been uh, following his book and he has been teaching me so much on uh, monastic biography. And uh, this is of uh, eminent monks. And uh, this is actually uh, derived from his uh, Stanford uh, PhD dis uh, dissertation. Um, but his second book is about um, Buddhism's um, uh, impact on uh, material cultures in China. And uh, this one is also uh, very, very uh, important. Uh, actually, the, this is, uh, uh, has been uh, kind of textbook <laughs> for uh, not only for graduate students, undergraduate, graduate, but also uh, for uh, any scholars working on uh, on this area. And I'm very happy to learn that John is now turning his attention to uh, Buddhist uh, historiography, because this is also something that I'm very, very interested in. And uh, I believe that today's talk uh, uh, probably also has uh, probably is a part of his ongoing research. I look forward to uh, a learning more from, uh, from his lectures. Uh, uh, so uh, now I would like to join, the, uh, to invite all of you to join me uh, to welcome the, uh, Professor uh, John Kislik, uh, Lop the whole family. Uh, chair positions at Stanford. Uh, so, Professor Kisnik, please. Thanks, Jinhua, for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation. Um, of course, Professor Hurwitz was a giant in the field, so it's a real honor to be invited to speak in this series. And finally, thank you to all of you for tuning in. Um, today, I want to discuss two very familiar topics for scholars of Buddhism, the foundational doctrine of karma, and for scholars of China, the strong Chinese historiographical tradition, and see what happens when we bring these two topics together. Uh, let's start with karma. If I had to pick one Buddhist doctrine or belief um, to illustrate the importance of Buddhism to Chinese civilization, I would pick karma the belief that there is an invisible moral order governing the universe and that the morality of our actions shapes our circumstances, both in this life and in future lives. Nothing quite like this existed before the entrance of Buddhism to China, but it's an idea that clearly took hold in China early on in the history of Chinese Buddhism and continues to be a foundational concept in understanding what for most Buddhists it means to be a Buddhist. Uh, where do we find karma in Chinese Buddhism? Uh, karma, is, of course, is often discussed in Buddhist doctrinal works composed in China, maybe most famously in uh, Hui Yuan's essay on the three forms of retribution, his San Bao Lun, but also in any number of influential texts by prominent Buddhist thinkers from uh, the early years of Chinese Buddhism right up to the present day. Uh, in addition to, these, to seeing karma in doctrinal works, we also occasionally can see illustrations of karma in Buddhist art. And I think it's, it's maybe best illustrated by one uh, motif in these images of the underworld. This is an example here. And that motif is my favorite piece of furniture in the netherworld which is the karmic mirror. So the idea is that after you die, you're taken to the court of the 10 kings. And before judgment is passed, you're led to a mirror. And when you look in that mirror, you see the significant events of your life and you're forced to confront your past 
I don't know if you can see this. I have a close up here where you can see better. So this poor man um, looks into uh, the mirror and sees that when he was alive and still fully clothed before he was stripped and bound, when he was still alive, he um, slaughtered an ox. So I'll give you one more example. This is another example, not from a, a painting on silk, but from a, an illustrated manuscript. And again, here we see uh, this poor man who has been again, stripped of his clothes and, and bound. And he looks into his past in the mirror and you see an image of him raising his fist to a monk, apparently about to strike the monk. So for the figures in these two paintings, um, the future does not look bright. But aside from representation in painting or illustrated manuscripts, karma is especially pervasive as a major motivation for any devotee to donate money for the creation of a whole array of Buddhist objects. When a patron supports the copying of a scripture or cutting of woodblock prints for printing a scripture or uh, uh, printing a whole set of scriptures, they usually have done so and continue to do so, at least in part, in the belief that they or their loved ones will be rewarded for the act through the mechanism of karma. Inscriptions tell us that the same is true for making icons, stupas, uh, monasteries, and even bridges. I was surprised some years ago uh, when I, I um, realized that karma played a key role in the history of the Chinese bridge. That is that often bridges were made uh, in part out of the belief that you could gain merit from constructing them. So this is a sixth century rubbing of a stele, part of a sixth century rubbing of a stele. And as you can see at the top of the stele, there are Buddhist images. But maybe even more important for understanding karma is that in the, in te the text of the inscription itself, it explains that, um, uh, that by making the bridge, those who donated and participated in the project are gaining merit, which they then transfer to their deceased loved ones. And this is an idea with sound scriptural foundation going back to ancient India and uh, early in Buddhist scriptures, and it's already in the Agamas. There's so much material of this sort that it would be easy to give a talk or even a series of talks just on the topic of karma in Chinese Buddhist material culture. Now, aside from scholastic works and material culture, karma is also the foundation of most Buddhist ritual in China, from small private funerals to large scale public rituals like the Shui Lu Fa Hui, the, the ritual for um, all of the deceased, for the souls of all creatures. In these sorts of rituals, the main role of monastics is to create merit by chanting scripture. And this merit is eventually then transferred to the deceased. So this is a, a fairly typical example of these little strips of paper that are hung on the side of the hall during the Shui Lu Fa Hui ritual. And each one of these strips represents the wishes of a donor. So the donor uh, pays to have a, a strip filled out that has the name of the person they want to receive the merit of the ritual to go to. It's usually uh, deceased ancestors, usually deceased parents. Now, all of this is probably familiar to most of you. Uh, this morning, I want to focus on what I think might be a less obvious topic, karma in historiography. It's not surprising, really, that we find karma in historiography, since, as I just said, we find it pretty much everywhere else in Chinese Buddhism. But I think it's worth reflecting on just what belief in karma brings to the historiographical project. Specifically, I want to focus on these four areas. The first is history without karma. That is, I think we can best understand karma if we consider types of Chinese historical writings that don't draw on karma. And if we look briefly at some of the possible alternatives to karma for explaining causation and morality in history. Second, I want to look at proving karma through history. So doctrinal texts tend to assert the existence of a karmic system 
and to describe how it works. But Buddhist historians thought that they could prove it by looking for traces of karma in the historical record. So this is an example of what history, unlike some other um, genres of writing, brings to the doctrine of karma. Just as interesting, I think, though, is the opposite, is karma as a tool for explaining history. That is how, according to Buddhist historians, did karma help to explain why historical events played out the way they did. And finally, in the last section, I want to talk about thinking about karma with history. And here I want to show that historical works don't just illustrate the belief in karma. They were and are a way for Buddhists to think through some of the knotty issues a belief in karma raises. So that is, I, I, I want to make the argument that we can think of history as a doctrinal genre. So I'll start with history without karma. And by this, I'm referring to non-Buddhist historiography in China. Specifically, how do other forms of history deal with the consequences of moral and immoral actions? Uh, let me start with an example. In one of the most celebrated passages of the first century BC classic, the records of the historian, the Shi Ji, Sima Qian, the, the father of Chinese history, tells the story of two men, Shu Qi and Bo Yi, who because of their loyalty to a fallen state are driven into exile, where eventually they die alone of starvation. Now this creates a problem for the historian because for Sima Qian, a key function of writing history was to provide moral lessons. But what sort of moral lesson are we supposed to learn about two virtuous men who because of their virtue died miserable deaths? After telling the story, Sima Qian comments at the end by saying, heaven is impartial. It is forever on the side of whoever is in the right. Yet though Shu Qian Bo Yi accumulated such virtue, in conduct were so pure, still they died of starvation. And he goes on to say, these are not the only stories of good men suffering bitter injustice. So prominent examples include Yen Hui, Confucius's disciple, a virtuous man who throughout his life lived in abject poverty. Uh, we could think of Wu Zixu, a brave general who was forced to commit suicide because he offered honest advice. Uh, Confucius himself, who who never really got the respect he deserved. And even though, though Sima Qian doesn't mention it in this passage, probably the most striking example of all is Sima Qian himself, who endured the humiliation and physical pain of castration for displeasing a fickle emperor when he acted in good conscience, bravely defending an innocent man. Uh, Sima Qian lists opposite examples as well. So he mentions, for instance, the bandit Zhu, Dao Zhu, who was a, a violent, cruel, selfish man, but who seems to have lived a long and happy life. Faced with the immense body of biographical evidence that he had mastered to compile his great work, showing how sometimes the good suffer miserable ends and the wicked so often prosper, Sima Qian in the end could only throw up his hands and lament the caprices of fate, the inscrutable workings of destiny. Sima Qian seems to say that if we read the historical record carefully, we see that yes, heaven is governing the universe and is on some level moral. But when we look more closely and examine specific historical cases, we soon discover that the world sometimes is just not fair. And it's Sima Qian's frustration and melancholy that makes the passage so moving and so relatable. But if we move ahead some eight centuries later to the seventh century, Dao Xuan, one of the most prolific Buddhist writers of his era and author of a number of historical works, returned to Sima Qian's problem, mentioning Sima Qian specifically, but Dao Xuan returns with a fresh perspective. Dao Xuan writes, that when previous historians like Sima Qian or his successor Ban Biao attempted to understand what they termed destiny, he says they're like someone who sees a piece of woven silk fabric 
without knowing how it was made on a loom. Or he has another example I like, which he says, it's like someone who sees grain in a storehouse without knowing that it was originally harvested from a field. That is, non-Buddhist historians, for all of their erudition, see the events of history race by, but don't understand the rational mechanism driving these events. Writing in a time before the introduction to China of Buddhism, early historians, Daoxuan tells us, were blind to a basic historical principle, karma, that explains everything. He tells us that what the Confucians term destiny, we Buddhists call karma. And karma is tied, destiny is tied to karma, and karma is tied to the mind. As the products of the mind are uneven, the results of karma vary. In other words, there is an intelligible moral order governing the course of history, but it's more complex than men like Sima Qian, ignorant of Buddhism, understood. Since reward and punishment are distributed in different degrees, depending in part on the intentions of the individuals involved. Moreover, he goes on to say, reward and punishment are spread out over many lives. And this point is key. Daoxuan emphasizes the complexities of how karma is played out in a lengthy essay that I won't quote for you here. But his main point is that a bad man, like bandit Zhu, like Dao Zhu, may prosper in his own lifetime for good karma he has accumulated in past lives, but he will suffer for his bad actions in a future life. And conversely, virtuous men like Shu Qi and Bo Yi, though they may suffer in their lives for karma they accumulated in past lives, in the future will certainly be rewarded for their virtue. What all of this tells us is that the price of moral deviance and the reward for virtue can only be understood when the ebb and flow of karmic retribution spanning many lives is understood. I'll talk about um, how Buddhist historians used karma in a moment, but if you take nothing else away from this talk, I hope this example illustrates the power of karma as a way of thinking about history. When reading historical writings, I at least have tended to ignore that karma is a fundamentally historical doctrine. There are some rare occasions when karma reveals itself almost instantaneously, but more often it reveals itself only after the passage of time. Sometimes very long stretches of time spanning lives, generations, even centuries. Who better to see these hidden patterns than the Buddhist historian? Still on the theme of history without karma, in addition to belief in a destiny arbitrated by heaven, another of karma's competitors in medieval China, um, at least, was the doctrine of inherited burden, cheng fu. So this is an idea that was developed in uh, early Taoist texts and was still prominent at least up to the sixth century. According to this doctrine, illness and other problems are often brought on as compensation for the immoral conduct uh, of our ancestors, not of us, but of our ancestors. Already from the uh, oracle bones, we know that in Chinese religion, our ancestors can affect our lives. There's a famous example of an oracle bone inscription describing a Shang king, asking if one of his ancestors was responsible for the king's toothache. But this is different. In Cheng Fu, uh, one believes that an ancestor behaved badly while they were alive, and that those they mistreated take revenge not on the ancestor, but on their descendants. So Cheng Fu is a Taoist belief from the early medieval period. It was not, as far as I can tell, all that pervasive or all that long lasting. But we can see something kind of similar if we go back to those vows uh, from contemporary Buddhist ritual. Oh, there we go. What is this? So these are, this is from the Shui Lu Fa Hui, and I want to look particularly at this um, strip, which mentions that the merit for this act should go to appease uh, disgruntled relatives and creditors. And the first part of this in particular shows how um, even after they're gone, 
you can never ever run away from family problems. They will always catch up with you. What I don't know, and what maybe one of you does, is how people in China today determine the source of their problems in past lives. But if we return to Chengfu and medieval Taoism, we do know that in medieval times, this belief led some to attempt to locate the source for their sickness in the family's past, in what one scholar, Michelle Strickman, has termed a witch hunt through history, in which the sick call on mediums to communicate with the netherworld in order to pinpoint the source of their suffering. There's no indication, however, that historians who adhered to these views applied them to their craft, and this is my focus. They were not driven to search the historical record for examples of, for instance, how the reprehensible acts of one man who dies long lived and prosperous in the end results in the impoverishment and early death of his sons or grandsons. The one case I've found of someone examining family history to test the theory of Cheng Fu is the sixth century Buddhist layman Li Shizheng, who in his treatise on karma argues that the doctrine of Cheng Fu does not hold up to historical scrutiny. I won't go into detail here, but Li cites specific examples of uh, ancestors who were virtuous men whose um, descendants suffered horribly or the opposite of ancestors who were uh, horrible human beings, but whose grandsons and, and great grandsons uh, prospered. So in short, according to Li Shizheng, the historical record does not bear out the theory that the moral conduct of one individual had direct bearing on subsequent generations in his family. And if I go back to those popular examples I showed you a moment ago from Fujian, even when people are concerned about deceased family members, the concern is that I wronged them in a past life, not that they wronged someone else. So the strip I showed above meant to appease disgruntled relatives and creditors suggests that in a previous life, I probably cheated some relatives out of an inheritance and died owing money. So here's another example. If we look at these two strips at the top, the point here is that I suffer is not that I suffer because of what my spouse did in a previous life, but presumably because of the way I treated my spouse, which is similar in intent to the, the strip beside it, where the merit is dedicated to a general in a previous life. Presumably the assumption is that in a past life, I somehow disappointed uh, the general that I fought for. Now, all of this is interesting, not just for understanding Chinese notions of guilt and responsibility, but also for thinking about the family more generally. Nonetheless, it was the Buddhist notion of karma that ultimately played the most prominent role in Chinese religion. And for our purposes, it's worth noting that karma is not only more satisfying than Sima Qian's notion of an inconsistent and unjust heaven, but also unlike Cheng Fu, karma is flexible enough to hold up well to historical scrutiny. This is the topic, karma in history, that I want to turn to now. In the case of karma, Buddhist historians did think that they could prove their case on the basis of the historical record. They told stories, uh, for example, of instant karma, in which punishment for immoral behavior strikes quickly. Probably the most famous example of instant karma in Chinese Buddhist history is the story of the ruler Sun Hao, who uh, encounters Buddhist images at a time when Buddhism was just being introduced into the southeast of China and uh, responds by um, urinating on an image of the Buddha, uh, joking that he is bathing the Buddha. In another story, he takes the image and places it in his latrine and uses the Buddha image to hold uh, the toilet stick. And the retribution for these uh, acts is almost immediate. So his body is racked by pain, particularly his genitals. And the pain doesn't let up until he cleans up the statues, uh, repents for his actions and venerates them properly. So this is an easy concept to understand and not so different from Chinese ideas of resonance of Gan Ying or the mandate of heaven of Tian Ming. 
that is, those who commit egregiously immoral acts are at times brought to justice by invisible forces. But if we want to solve Sima Qian's problem of explaining why at times the good suffer and the bad are fortunate, historians needed to couple karma with rebirth. And to demonstrate rebirth, Buddhist uh, historians were fond of citing evidence for it, even in the dynastic histories. The evidence, evidence for rebirth is hard to come by. Since in theory, only those of great accomplishments, especially accomplishments in meditation, obtain the supernormal power of being able to see into their own past lives or the lives of others. But there are ruptures in the natural order that allow glimpses into past lives. For example, uh, the biography of Yang Hu or the story of Bao Jing in the Jin Shu, the, the history of the Jin. So the Jin Shu tells a story that's often cited in Buddhist historical works of Yang Hu. And it's said that he goes on to become a, a prominent official. But when he was a child of five years old, at one point he asks his uh, wet nurse to go fetch his favorite golden ring, his favorite toy. And his wet nurse tells him, you don't own a golden ring. But Yang Hu then says, of course I do. And he tells her, it's buried next to such and such a tree in the home of such and such a person um, on the other side of town. They go there and they dig up next to the tree and they find that in fact, there is a golden ring there. At which point uh, the, the family that lives there is astonished because just five years previous, their son who owned a golden ring died. The story of Bao Jing is similar. Uh, for Bao Jing, it says that when he was five years old, he tells his parents that in a previous life, he had different parents uh, who lived in a, a different village. And they go to this other, and, and that he died when he um, tripped and fell down a well. They then go out and they find this family in the other village, and they verify his story that they had lost a child who was nine years old when he fell down a well. In both cases, the suggestion, even though it's never explicitly stated, is that children are close enough to their previous existence that they can still at times remember their past life. There are many claims for rebirth in Buddhist historiography, and not all of them involve children. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, Dao Xuan himself, who I already mentioned. He claimed that he was the reincarnation of the equally famous monk Sung Yo. And this was revealed to Dao Xuan in a vision. And Sung Yo, uh, historians tell us, was in turn said to be the reincarnation of another monk named Sung Hu. In this case, uh, Dao Xuan didn't realize his previous existence as a child, nor did he claim any special powers. Instead, he was visited by a very old god, a very old deva, who told him who he had been in a previous life. The link to the life before that, that Sung Yo was the reincarnation of the monk Sung Hu, was based on the speculations of subsequent historians. And this last bit is the move that interests me the most. Historians uh, took it as part of their job to look for connections between people of different times and speculate that one might be the reincarnation of another. Uh, one historian argued that the evidence suggested that the 10th century monk uh, uh, De Shao was the reincarnation of Zhiyi, and Tantai sources insisted that Zhiyi was the reincarnation of an Indian who had been present at one of the Buddhist sermons. The monk uh, Zhi Wei was in a previous life the official Xu Ling. Uh, the Tang official Fang Guan was a monk in a former life, as was Emperor Wen of the Sui, Sui Wen Di. And later, the great poet Su Shi was also said to have been a monk in a former life. Sometimes Buddhist historians speculate on the rebirths of figures who aren't even important for Chinese Buddhist history. Uh, Zan Ning, for example, claimed that uh, Cai Yong was the reincarnation of the scholar Zhang Heng, and the Tang general Wei Gao was the reincarnation of uh, no less than Zhuge Liang. Asserting these stories helps to explain the personality and actions of a given figure inherited from a previous incarnation. And it was looking for these similarities that allowed historians to determine rebirths. 
Sung Yeo and Dao Xuan were both, for instance, specialists in the Vinaya who also composed historical works. In fact, the two are quite similar in many ways. At times, though, Buddhist historians go a step further and link the morality of a figure in this life to consequences in the next. This sort of detailed information was even harder to come by and was only revealed with precision under extraordinary circumstances. So um, let me give you an example from the return to from death narrative. In the sixth century work, Chu San Zhang Ji Ji, um, a man dies temporarily and then is revived shortly thereafter. And when he comes to, he describes what he saw while he was dead. And what he describes is that he descended to the courts of the underworld, much like the scene that we looked at previously with the karma mirror. And in the underworld, he sees the famous virtuous monk Fazu and sees that this monk Fazu is greeted warmly by the officials of the underworld and is escorted off to a paradise. But he also sees uh, the, the great Taoist enemy of Buddhism, Wang Fu, who is greeted with great anger and hostility by the kings of the other world and is sent off to be punished in hell. Biographies of eminent monks record a number of these return from death stories, full of precise dates and historical details that describe the temporarily dead who see punishments meted out for those who behaved badly in life. For instance, there are examples of uh, hunters who go to the other world and are punished for it, or of those who stole monastic property who are punished in hell. Our temporarily dead witnesses assure us that the bad, even if they prosper in life, are indeed punished for their acts, and that those who lived virtuous lives, whatever their fate in the world of the living, are compensated in their next lives. That's one type of narrative that gets around the problem of uh, finding evidence for uh, karmic compensation. Another type of story that illustrates karma in Buddhist historiography is the account that includes the pronouncements of holy men, what I call here the holy man uh, narrative. So for example, the Song Gao Song Zhuan tells the story of a young man who is a mediocre, frustrated student. He wants to be a scholar, but he has a very poor memory. He can't understand anything he reads. And when he does finally understand it, he immediately forgets what he's read. And on top of all this, he's always had very bad luck with his health. He's been frail and ill his entire life. And then in a moment of desperation, he's wandering in the mountains when he encounters a mysterious holy man who offers him a magic piece of fruit. He takes one bite of this magic piece of fruit and instantly uh, remembers all the details of his previous life. And he recalls now that in his previous life, he had been a monk, but that he had, had insisted on preaching a false and misleading doctrine. And that is the karma that is responsible for his suffering in this life. So he then uh, decides to change his ways. Instead of being a frustrated student, he becomes a virtuous monk and devotes himself towards accumulating a good karma that he can apply to a better life uh, in his subsequent lives. So these sorts of stories, whether they're return from birth narratives or holy man narratives, these sorts of karmic lore accumulated um, you know, decade after decade throughout the history of Chinese Buddhism and so permeate the historical record that to question this idea of karma and to question the ability of the historian to uncover examples of karma shaping lives would have been unreasonable for both writers and readers of Buddhist historical works. That is not to say that Buddhist historians did not at times examine accounts carefully to determine their accuracy. They didn't accept all accounts necessarily. Zanning in one case where he tries to trace three linked lives is careful to go through the dates and verify that a particular monk was both a subsequent incarnation of an official and of another monk. So he goes through and says that there's no overlapping of dates. So it's very possible that this figure was first a monk, then an official, and then a monk. In this case, he was careful to reassure his readers that the dates do not overlap. But in another case, uh, Zanning slipped up 
and a later historian called him out for it. So Zhu Xiu in his uh, um, Long Xing Bian Nian Tong Lun, one of my favorite uh, Buddhist historical works, criticizes Zan Ning, his fellow Buddhist historian, for repeating a story about the previous birth of the famous rebel An Lushan. So the supposedly previous incarnation, Zhu Xiu points out, was seen in a year when An Lushan had already been born. So after refuting the story, Zhu Xiu announces that he reluctantly is going to have to leave this story out of his own history because it do doesn't hold up to scrutiny. I just love these instances of Buddhist historians showing their work. That is, Zhu Xiu spills a lot of ink demonstrating how a sloppy previous historian transmitted a story that simply can't be true and then ostentatiously says that he can't include the story in his own work since it isn't up to his own standards. We can see in accounts like these that Buddhist historians approached karma with their own set of criteria. They did not see these stories as a way of propagating Buddhist doctrines irrespective of their historicity. Instead, they approached such stories with the pride of well-trained historians sensitive to historical context and dates. The stories mattered because they could be demonstrated to meet historiographical standards of source criticism and chronology. They weren't just miracle stories. They were accounts that had been vetted by professionals. These um, previous examples show how Buddhist Buddhists use the historical genre to propagate the doctrine of karma. But for Buddhist authors, the past was more than just factual fodder for propagating Buddhist doctrine. Here I want to return to the thrust of the example I started with, when Daoxuan explains that poor Sima Qian couldn't see karmic patterns in the historical record and so was puzzled and distressed. The Buddhist historian felt no such confusion. In other words, not only could history be used in service to karma, karma could be employed to explain history. Every biography is in some sense a puzzle in which the author and reader alike scrutinize the family background, the birth and early child, childhood of the subject in search of clues that will explain why she or he became the man or woman that would one day make them worthy of a biography. This mystery at the heart of every life story accounts in large measure for the continued success of biography as a genre. In the case of monks, family background is not as useful as it is for other types of figures, since assuming early vows of celibacy strictly maintained, one cannot come from a long line of Buddhist monks. And even when, for instance, a great exegetical monk can be shown to come from a family famous for producing scholars, this still begs the question that shapes the opening of every monastic biography. Why did the boy become a monk in the first place? To answer this question, Buddhist historians could look for clues suggesting the role of karma from past lives. It's common, for instance, in the first few lines of a biography of a monk to say that his mother, when pregnant with the child, suddenly had no taste for meat. The suggestion is that the boy was born to become a monk because of actions in his past lives. And biographers of eminent monks often stop to explain explicitly that the reason such and such a monk early on demonstrated prodigious talent, talent for scholarship, talent for preaching, talent for learning foreign languages, was because of karma accumulated in a previous life. While hagiographical motifs may have been inspired by more general notions of divinity, historians interpreted them through a karmic lens. So if Christians saw in the early life of Jesus signs of his divinity, in particular his ability to debate with learned men already as a child, Buddhist historians would have seen evidence of qualities carried over from a previous life. Seen through this lens of karma, new aspects of the past came into focus with unprecedented clarity. A natural affinity for doctrine or devotion at an early age signaled not only that a boy would become a monk, but that he had been a monk in a previous life. 
Unlike other types of historians, Buddhist historians were especially attuned to look for these karmic clues. In addition to detecting the karmic conditions that led boys to the monastic vocation, they could decipher other puzzles in the historical record on the basis of karma as well. There's a famous instance that a number of modern scholars have drawn attention to, in which at the end of the fifth century, word spread of a remarkable young girl who at the age of eight would fall into a trance and recite entire Buddhist scriptures that no one had heard of. These episodes were told continued until she was 16. At times, we're told, she would close her eyes and sit in meditation, then recite these scriptures. Some said that she ascended to heaven, others that she received them from a spirit. She spoke fluently, as if she had learned them in another life. She had others write them out. All at once, she would stop again. After recording these events, Sung Yo and his great catalog of scriptures, classified the text revealed to the girl as dubious. But a century later, Dao Xuan returned to the case. Like Sung Yo, he was particularly troubled by the assumption by many that the scriptures had been transmitted by spirits. Any texts that were not translated by well-known figures, preferably as part of a large team sponsored by the court, were suspect. Instances of spirit writing or revealed scripture threatened to erase the divide between Buddhism and Taoism, and perhaps even more importantly, between Buddhism and popular religion. For elite monks like Dao Xuan, who had himself participated in one of Xuanzang's famous translation teams, Buddhist scriptures were carried to China by sophisticated, well-traveled monks, as learned as they were intrepid, and then translated by state-sponsored committees staffed by eminent monks and court literati. They were not produced in an afternoon by an eight-year-old girl in a trance. One explanation is that the girl fabricated false scriptures on her own. Another is that she was possessed by a deity who transmitted them. But karma offers yet another possibility. For an explanation of what must have happened, Dao Xuan turned to karma. If we examine this case according to Buddhist scriptures, Dao Xuan tells us, we see that it is just a matter of remnant karma. There is nothing more to say about it. I have read in non-Buddhist writings, those who are born with knowledge are the highest. Next come those who attain knowledge through study. This is from Confucius from the Analects. This though is limited to discussing this life and ignores past lives. So Dao Xuan wasn't only critical of Sima Qian, he's also critical here of Confucius for his ignorance of karma and rebirth. If not, he continues, how are we to distinguish the difference between Buddhist and non-Buddhist, between sagely and the superficial? This is just as in a previous biography, Tan Di remembered the paperweight. This is a similar story to the Yang Hu story I told before, where um, uh, Tan Di uh, remembers, as a child, remembers a paperweight that he had in a previous life. Or the recent layman Suiza, who remembered the golden bracelet. And this seems to be a um, reference to the Yang Hu story I told a minute ago again, uh, but mixed up with another Tang rebirth story about a man named Suixian. This is another instance of this pattern. She certainly did not receive the scriptures from an external spirit. The point then is that the girl must in a previous existence have memorized these scriptures. This is an example of one of the rare instances of overlap in which a young child still happens to maintain an especially close connection to their previous life. More generally, in this new way of reading history, the historian was not just assessing the qualities of the individuals he described, and highlighting the moral, moral lessons we as readers should derive from their stories. Nor was he simply using the stories to drum home the truth of Buddhist doctrine. In addition to all this, based on his knowledge of Buddhist doctrine and his training as a karmic sleuth, he was explaining what happened and why. Buddhist historians wending their way through a series of karmic labyrinths saw the relentless force of karma at work in the lives of all of their subjects, monks and laymen alike. Emperor Gao of the Northern Qi was in a previous life a raksha, 
which explains his violent disposition early on in his reign. Emperor Shizong carried out a persecution of Buddhism in 955 because of his old karmic aspirations that he carried over from a previous life. Nor did karma stop with the effects brought on by previous deeds. For these new acts that these figures committed themselves only created more karma that would bear fruit one day sooner or later. In the case of Emperor Wu of the Zhou, notorious in Buddhist history for his persecution of the Sangha, historians related sightings of the former emperor undergoing punishment in hell. Zhipan, the great 13th century uh, Buddhist historian, relying on a variety of sources, including historical events in the lives of rulers and accounts of their fates in the netherworld, confidently demonstrated that the emperors responsible for all of the major persecutions of Buddhism in Chinese history to his day had all suffered retribution for their actions. In other words, the Buddhist historian explained that these emperors persecuted Buddhism in part because of bad tendencies carried over from former lives and that they were later punished for their subsequent actions. In short, the history of Buddhism in China, including the positive qualities of Buddhist heroes, the behavior, behavior of peculiar children, and the violent tendencies of malicious emperors could all be explained at least in part through the workings of karma. The final point I want to make before wrapping up is that at times historians aren't just using the historical genre to demonstrate the importance of karma. They aren't just preachers and they aren't just using karma to explain history. At times, history serves as a field for exploring the workings of karma and thinking through some of the problems it creates. Let me illustrate this with just one, one example and then I'll conclude. In the great Tiantai historical work, the Fozu Tongji, the compiler Zhi Pan grappled with the question of the relationship between the victim and the agent of karmic retribution in historical accounts of assassinations. The problem arises when he tells the story of how Zhu Qu Meng Xun, ruler of the Northern Liang, became angry with the translator, Dharmakshama, when the monk insisted on returning to his homeland. The furious king then dispatched an assassin to kill Dharmakshama. Earlier, just before Dharmakshama left for the West, he said to a friend sending him off, the time for my karmic retribution has arrived. And soon thereafter, uh, Dharmakshama was in fact murder, murdered. So it's because this monk insists on leaving the ruler, the ruler sends an assassin to have him killed. But even before he's killed, the monk recognizes that he will be killed and that he will be killed because of karma accumulated from previous lives. But the interesting twist of the story comes after the assassination of the Dharmakshama. So after Dharmakshama's murder, Zhu uh, Chu Bang Xuan, the ruler who had ordered his death, is suddenly filled with regret for what he has done, murdering, having, murder, having a, a prominent monk murdered. And in the middle of the night, the ruler has a vision of a divine being wielding a sword. And as soon as he sees this monk, this ferocious uh, being with a sword, uh, the ruler promptly falls dead. Now this raises a question for Jirpan. And the question was, if Dharmakshama himself saw that he was going to die for his own karmic reasons, why, why should Zhu Chu Meng Xun suffer for being the agent of this inevitable death? Uh, Jirpan writes, when Zhu Chu Meng Xun dispatched an assassin to kill Dharmakshama, a divine being felled the king with a sword. Some say that since these holy masters fully understood their karma and so allowed their own karmic debt to come to completion, why should their killers receive retribution in this way? So there's similar discussion in Abhidharmic texts of the monsters who punish sinners in hell. And the question is, those monsters in hell who are poking us with their tridents, um, are they accumulating bad karma? But aren't they fulfilling a role by, by balancing out the, the karmic, karmic distribution? So why should they suffer for doing something that is a necessary job for the system to work? And this is a Jirpan's uh, response. 
it must be that deities who protect the Dharma were angered over these assaults on the worthy. Moreover, and here's the key point, the malevolent minds of the assassins were sufficient in themselves to bring their fate upon them. This cannot be compared to the exchange of blame and retribution between ordinary people. In other words, the agent of Dharmakshama's murder, whether it be the king or a spirit, was responsible for their own actions, regardless of the state of Dharmakshama's karma, and so would in turn carry the burden of the karmic consequences of their act. None of us, he seems to be saying, are automatons. The king, even if his, if his actions played a role in balancing out the karmic debt of the monk he has murdered, was still responsible for what he did. I could give more examples of this sort, but my overall point is simply that Abhidharma and formal doctrinal essays aren't the only genres in which Buddhist thinkers contemplate the ramifications of doctrinal problems. History too provoked this kind of speculation and debate, often by authors steeped in Buddhist doctrine and often at a sophisticated level. I don't want to leave you with the impression that karma was the only model of causation that Buddhist historians drew on. They also talk about destiny, uh, dynastic cycles, the decline of the Dharma, and any number of more mundane factors. But if we are looking for a model of causation that separates Chinese Buddhist historians from their counterparts at court, none was more pervasive or powerful than karma. Uh, thank you.